um, I don't know, really, to another place, I suppose, some sort of other world, maybe. Uh, they get buried. I'm an atheist. I think we just we just rot in the ground and fertilise the trees. I don't believe that there's uh, necessarily a heaven. There is a heaven. There's a heaven probably within. I think the soul lives on, uh, but in a positive way. I think it, there's a bit of transference that goes on at that point. Well, you can call, call it heaven. Could be heaven, could be whatever, but it's basically a rest, spiritual, in any place, any estate. They disintegrate. The dead. I don't think there's any, anything else, really. Uh, good question. Not sure. Go to a better place, hopefully. So what are some of the consequences of not going into the world and proclaiming the gospel? Well, first of all, there'll be a general decrease in the overall number of Christians in the world. Secondly, there'll be a decline in church attendance. Take America, for example. According to the pastor and author Jim Saibala, despite all the Christian broadcasting and the high-profile campaigns, the Christian population has not been growing in numbers nationally. In a given week in 1996, church attendance was down to 37%, which was a 10-year low. Take Britain as another example. According to a research team at the University of Manchester, church attendance in Britain plummeted from 20.3% of the population in 1991 to 16.8% in 1999, which is a massive 3.5% fall. A 3.5% fall equates to 426,300 people who dropped out of church attendance over a nine-year period. The same research showed a decline in a belief in God among the non-Christian population. Articles like this one here, Belief in God Declines in Britain, and Most Britons Belong to No Religion. At first glance, the religious state of the UK looks very healthy, with 71.6% of the population claiming to be Christian. In the 2001 National Census, the religious state of the UK looks very healthy. Christianity, just over 42 million. No religion, 9.1 million. Muslims, 1.5 million. Hindus, 552,000. Jedi Knights, 390,000. Sikhs, 329,000. Jewish, 259,000. And Buddhists, 144,000. But as we look in more depth, it becomes apparent that the UK is in trouble. According to a Tear Fund's 2007 report, whilst 72% of the British public declared themselves as Christians during the national census, a mass of 66% have no actual connection to any church or even any religion. The Christian Research Group's fourth English church census reported that half a million people stopped attending church on Sundays between 1998 and 2005. In 2006, the Daily Telegraph's religious affairs correspondent, Jonathan Peter, says while 1,000 new people are joining a church each week, 2,500 are leaving. According to a 2007 Tear Fund report, 10% of the UK adult population go to church at least weekly, 15% attend church at least monthly, 26% attend church at least annually. In fact, one in four of the UK adult population said they go to church at least once a year. 59% never or practically never go to church. Most of them are unreceptive and closed to attending church. Church going is simply not on their agenda. Are the consequences of not proclaiming the gospel? Well, here are the statistical facts. Over the last 30 years in most Western countries, the truly born-again Christian population as a percentage of the general population has seen no significant increase. In fact, in some Western countries, there's been a decrease. So a Christian population that's not growing in real terms, a decline in the belief in God in the non-Christian population, and a decline in church attendance. Are these declines just coincidental of a church that stopped proclaiming the gospel, or are they a consequence? How on earth have we come to this place in our lives where 98% of us don't proclaim the gospel? One contributing factor is that everyone thinks that everyone else is doing it. 
And because most churches have almost no accountability with respect to the proclamation of the gospel, the awful truth that so few were proclaiming the gospel has gone completely unnoticed. And perhaps one of the most serious consequences of all is the increase in the rise and spread of false gospels. How do false gospels start and spread? Non-Christians have eternity in their hearts. That's what it tells us in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. Through conscience and creation, they have a God awareness. And either consciously or subconsciously, they start searching for the spiritual. And when they don't hear the real gospel, they start making up their own. And in turn, they start evangelizing other non-Christians with their made-up gospels. And that's precisely what's happened. And you see, if we don't go to them while they're searching and explain the true gospel, they're going to plunge into hell, clinging onto these false gospels, because we've never proclaimed the true gospel to them. And what's even more tragic is there are many churches that have been influenced by these false gospels that have originated and circulated in the non-Christian world, and they've adopted them as their own, even proclaiming them as the true gospel. So what are some of the false gospels being proclaimed today? There's the liberal gospel where everyone is already a Christian. Then there's the we're born in a Christian country gospel, where we're all Christians if we live in this country. Then there's the attending church at special times of the year makes me a Christian gospel. One person says to himself, if I go to church at Christmas and Easter, well, that proves I'm a Christian, doesn't it? Then there is participating in Christian rituals makes me a Christian gospel. The come to Jesus, he's a good accessory gospel. The come to Jesus, he'll make you rich gospel. Well, it's certainly true that everything that we have comes from God, but to be preaching the message that when you come to God, you'll be rich is a lie. The good works gospel, where I'm going to work my way into heaven. There's the Jesus loves you gospel, where nobody needs to make any change to their current lifestyle to become a Christian. Jesus can simply be tacked on. The Christianity is a bed of roses gospel, where after conversion, life's going to be happy ever after. All pain and problems cease and health, wealth and financial blessings will pour in. If I belong to a particular denomination, I'm saved gospel. Or just say the quick prayer and you're in gospel. You know, got Jesus. Then there's keep your fingers crossed gospel, where no one here on earth can have any assurance that they're really saved. Then there's the I hope the good I've done outweighs all the bad I've done gospel. What about doing good things and being kind to other people is the way to get to heaven gospel? Well, indeed, doing good things and being kind to other people is the fruit of genuine salvation, but never the root of it. The root of it is Christ. Then there's the join the church as a lifestyle change option gospel, where we have this very happy picture instead of this, where the Lord Jesus Christ said, come and follow me. There's no reason why our publicity can't be good and professional. But in this lovely picture, where does the homeless fit in? Where does the hurting fit in and the outcast? How have we found it so easy to forget the warnings in Galatians chapter 1 verse 9, where it says, Woe to you if you preach another gospel. I say it again, if anyone preaches another gospel, let him be eternally condemned. These are just some of the other gospels being preached today by non-Christians to each other, and by many Christians to non-Christians as well. And literally millions and millions of non-Christians are putting their trust completely in these other Gospels for their salvation. And many will plunge into hell, sincerely holding on to these false Gospels. Because they've never heard the truth through the Gospel. And the reason why they've never heard the truth through the Gospel is because we as a generation have stopped proclaiming it. And I don't want this generation, my generation, to be remembered for this. Nor will any other Christian. This is a really serious matter. I think live your life in terms of how you want to be treated. So it's about mutual respect, it's about caring for environments, the world, that kind of thing. Uh, you have to be a good person, yeah? That's it. Take care of the other people, don't do anything wrong and that's it. You're going there for sure. Well, as far as I know, you have to live a clean life and live a godly life to go to heaven. Know yourself. Try to be good. Nobody's perfect, you know. Let's try to be good. Everyone who does good will be rewarded accordingly. There's no difference. Islam may be different, Christian may be different, but anyone who do, who do good may be rewarding, rewarded accordingly. That's what I think. I think if you live your life generally in a good way, hopefully karma or whatever it is will come back round and 
that's how I live my life anyway. So. But I mean, a lot of my friends are not Catholics, but they're good people. But they will get to heaven. I hope so, yeah. There's a widely held notion that surely all the good I've done outweighs all the bad, so I'll be okay. It's amazing how many people, even devout church attendees, believe in being saved by good works. It's easy to see where this idea comes from, and a lot of it makes sense. Jesus spoke a lot about loving one another and living a good life. But when we confuse this teaching with the biblical message of salvation and our one true God-given purpose on this planet, we are in danger of missing out on God's almighty provision for us and are plunging into hell, sincerely holding on to a false gospel. Someone once shared a powerful analogy with me to illustrate how no matter how good we are or how hard we try, there's nothing we can do to earn eternity with God. Imagine that everyone in the United States is lined up on the shore of California and told that they have to swim to Hawaii or die. There'll be all kinds of people from all walks of life in many different shapes, sizes and levels of fitness and ability. There's the 500 pounds man who can barely walk across the room without getting out of breath. As he begins to walk out into the water, a big wave knocks him over and he can't get up. He gargles salt water and quickly drowns. Then there's the middle-aged man who used to be a great swimmer. He begins to swim, but it isn't long before he begins to get tired. He practices survival techniques he learns in the Boy Scouts and tries to keep going, but eventually the water overcomes him. Next, there's the girl from the high school swimming team. She has been swimming most days of her life for the past 10 years and is in excellent physical condition. She paces herself, starting slowly and steadily, one mile, two miles, 10 miles, but soon she begins to get cramps in her tired muscles. She can't go on. She too gargles the salt water and drowns. Following on is the marathon swimmer, who regularly swims the English Channel just for fun. He starts out strong and steady, soon passing the 10 mile mark, then the 20. At 50 miles, he's feeling the struggle, and it's not long before the waves take their toll. Finally, he succumbs to the power of the water. Although some swimmers are much better than others, there's not a single swimmer who can cover over 2,500 miles all the way to Hawaii. In the same way, even the best person in the world can't get into heaven on the basis of his or her good works. Only God's grace makes the journey to heaven possible. Doing good things and being helpful to others is the fruit of the gospel, but not the root of it. The more one studies these disturbing truths and meditates on them, other considerations begin to emerge. For example, there doesn't seem to be any obvious reason why the vast majority of Christians in the world would have stopped proclaiming the gospel. It's not as though we, we lack finance. What most of us spend on luxuries in one week would be sufficient to learn how to proclaim the gospel. It's not as though we can't get access to training. We've got access to so many things. The web, TV, video, CD, DVD, phenomenal graphic designs. What did John Wesley and Martin Luther have? They had a Bible, a horse, and the Holy Spirit. It's not as though we lack power. There's no lack of God's help at all. In Acts, we were given the Holy Spirit, and through him, we were given power. The Spirit was given for witness, as it says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. In Romans chapter 5, verse 5, it says, God has poured out his love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, whom he's given us. And that same Holy Spirit that fell on the believers in Acts is the same Holy Spirit that dwells in the hearts of every true believer. It's not as though the command's too complicated to understand. The command's so simple, it says in Mark 16, 15, go into the world and proclaim the gospel. Ask a little child what that means, and they'll tell you it means go into the world and proclaim the gospel. It's not as though there's not enough people on the planet to share the gospel with. There's over 7 billion people on the planet today, and growing. And it's not as though that the fear of loneliness is stopping us. There's a certain promise in the Bible, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, that says, I will be with you to the very end of the age. It's probably fair to say most people have some kind of God awareness and are searching for the spiritual. Where do they look? In generations gone by, people in the West at least had some kind of grounding in the teaching of Christ. They might have been blighted by tradition, ritual and fear. But there are many testimonies of people who at a point of true searching in later life called out to the God of their Sunday school days and found him as their saviour and friend. Of course, there are many debates to be had here about the place of Christianity in modern society. 
But the question to really consider is what happens when non-Christians don't hear the true gospel? When they don't hear the gospel from Christians, there's an innate tendency, albeit unconsciously, to make up their own gospel. A lifestyle, a feel-good, life-enhancing discipline, which in turn, they start evangelising to others. More tragic still, some churches have been unwittingly influenced by such false gospels. There's a grave danger that ideas that have originated and circulated in the non-Christian community are adopted into our churches and accepted as though they are the true gospel. Jesus knew of this hazard, which I'm sure is why he was careful to say, go into all the world and preach the good news. He's not talking about just any old good news here. He has a specific message in mind, and that message is clear and uncompromising throughout Scripture. The Apostle Paul also recognised our inherent need for teaching that satisfies and endorses our own desires. In his second letter to Timothy, chapter 4, verses 2 to 4, he gives the charge, Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. And do you believe that there's something like a heaven or a hell? No. No. Absolutely not. Why should there be? Why should there be? You, if, you, if you can see something, hey, today's raining, I believe it's raining. Why should I dream something I never see anything? We know what we need to do. As a Muslim, I need to pray five times in the days, yeah? After death, um, there's possibly, but it's not been proved until something's proven, then, you know, when I see something happen, then I'll believe it. But until then, I just believe that, yeah, we just fertilise the trees. I, I, I do believe in fate and serendipity, so I think that whole idea is uh, associated to the way the soul is transferred. Do you believe in God? I don't, no. I, I believe there is, there is something, but I don't believe in a higher power. No, no one doing bad in this world, world would go to heaven. That, that, that's a universal concept. Be it Islam, be it Christ, Christianity, whatever. Uh, I, I think that the whole idea of afterlife quite often is, is used in order to keep people in their place. So you have a lot of people, the whole idea of the meek inheriting the earth, well actually, the, what is it the saying goes? The meek inherit the earth and the rich inherit the mineral rights. People should actually deal with their lives here and now. What happens to them afterwards, nobody can say. Maybe there is an afterlife and maybe I'll see you there, but I doubt it. There's no natural or logical reason why the Great Commission should have collapsed in the world. But the more one studies and prays about the matter, the more it becomes clear that driving the collapse of the Great Commission in the world are principalities and powers. And behind them is their leader, Satan. 